Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you're with me this evening. And tonight's Bible study, we will be in the book of Luke, chapter Luke, <clears throat> the chap, um, <laughs> the Gospel of Luke. So if you want to turn there, we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 5. So before we begin, let's open up in prayer. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for gathering all of us together this evening, Lord, as we open up your word to, to Luke chapter 5. And Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to illuminate these, uh, these passages, Lord, um, to reveal, to illuminate these truths so that we can have an understanding of what you have written in this book. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, hi, Sandrita. <clears throat> so, this part of the Gospel of Luke covers Jesus' ministry as he spent time teaching, preaching, and performing miracles. Everything that Jesus did demonstrated the Gospel, which is the good news. All of his works, his teachings, were essential to Jesus' mission and all called for a response from all who heard and saw him. So as we will see, this is certainly the case in our text this afternoon that we will cover today. So why don't we begin with Luke chapter 5 verse 1. So it was, <clears throat> as the multitude pressed about him, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out uh, a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. So in Luke chapter 4, we saw Jesus teaching in the synagogues. Now we see him teaching out in the open, which is the beginning of his public ministry for the first time in this gospel. The Lake of Genesaret was also known as the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. However, in the Old Testament, it was known as the Sea of Shinrath. Genesaret um, was an ancient town allotted to the tribe of Naphtali and is no longer there. The name Genesaret was also used for the plain of Genesaret, known for its beauty, its fertility, and rich soil. And it was actually called the Paradise of Galilee. Genesaret is a word that means garden of riches. It was known for its great harvests of grain and fields of harvest and plenty. <clears throat> the Valley of Genesaret was a place where the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment and was healed. It's also a place where people brought to Jesus all who were diseased and they sought him, that they might touch him and also be healed. The author of the other Gospels refer to this freshwater sea as the sea, which is very familiar to us. Now, the sea is not very big. This sea is 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. But it's a very picturesque lake that served as the backdrop for much of Jesus' ministry. Jesus had just healed many people in Caper Capernaum, which is located on the northwest shore of this lake. Fame went out about Jesus everywhere in the region. People heard about Jesus and his amazing deeds. So news about him saturated this region. As a result, multitudes of people searched for Jesus. And when they found him, the multitude of people was so great on this particular day 
that they pressed upon him or pressed up against him to hear the word of God. As Jesus stood on the shore by the lake of Gennesaret, the multitude was pressing upon him so much that he was actually running out of, of dry land to stand on. I can imagine his feet and hem of his garment getting wet as the waves of this sea lapped up against him. As he was pressed further and further towards the water's edge, he saw two boats and he got into one of the boats. The boat he chose belonged to a fisherman by the name of Simon. And it's interesting to note that the name Simon means something. You know what his name means? Listening or hearing. Don't you think that's interesting? So, you know, Jesus got into Simon's boat. He chose his boat, got in it, and he had him push it out a little bit from land so he could teach the people. You know, the sea would have had an amplification uh, uh, to, to it in that the sea ar around him would have amplified his voice so that all who were there could hear him clearly. He chose Simon's fishing boat. Now, this was not by chance, as we shall see. Have you noticed that um, God often chooses many things to accomplish his will and his purposes on earth? You know, you think about when you go through the Bible, how God uses earthly things, like he used David's sling and he used the jawbone of a donkey to help Samson, an axe head, five loaves of bread and two fishes, a cross and an empty tomb to mention a few things. But here we see Jesus using Simon Peter's fishing boat. And his boat became a vessel of transformation that day. You know, a fisherman's life, you know, a fisherman's boat was his life. His whole purpose of living, his boat put food on his table. It enabled him to have money to pay his bills, to buy his clothes and material goods. His boat put a roof over his head. His, his boat was his career and his life. So Simon's life was his boat. You know, the reason you are saved is because Jesus chose one day to sit in your boat. You know, he entered into your life and then you heard him teach. And your day, you know, your life was never the same, was it? You know, then you had a responsibility, you see, after he teaches, he comes into your life, he sits down in your life and begins to teach you. Then you have a responsibility to respond, don't you? You can either accept him or reject him. And verse four, <clears throat> When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. You know, Simon was on shore washing his nets after that long, fruitless night of toil on the Sea of Gennesaret, a, a, a sea that was named after fruitfulness, out of abundance, that sea that night was a sea of emptiness and his nets came up void. You know, so there Simon was. He was sitting on the shore. He's washing his nets as he's listening to Jesus teach. He could hear everything that Jesus said. And Jesus being in his boat, his life, of course he could hear everything Jesus was saying. And Simon, his name meaning listening or hearing, he listened and he heard and he took to heart what Jesus was saying. Because after Jesus taught, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
So in verse five, but Simon answered, or, you know, here we have a response. Remember, you always have a response. Uh, Simon has a response for Jesus. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. See, right here, he's letting Jesus know that he uh, and the other fishermen with him had fished all night and, and caught nothing. Nevertheless, he said, at your word, I will let down the net. So Simon, in hearing the word of God, you know that the word did something inside of him. You see, the word of God always does a work. The word of God is powerful. As the Bible says, the gospel is the power of God unto all who believe. So here we see the word of God is active. It's living. Did you know that the word of God that you are hearing tonight is living? It is active. It, it, his word is sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and of marrow. And it also discerns the thoughts and the intent of your heart. You know, the word always does a work in the life of the hearer. You will never stay the same once you hear the gospel. You know, the, the word of God transforms your life. People in hearing the gospel, they will either go away mad or they're going to go away glad. But know either way that the word is doing a work. You know, the gospel will either bring a person out of darkness and into his marvelous light, or it will bring a person from darkness into even a deeper darkness. You know, how you respond to the voice of Jesus calling you will determine your eternal destiny. Fishermen, once they had fished all night long, I guarantee they were tired. It's exhausting work. And now they had this tedious task of washing their nets in preparation for the next fishing trip that would have been that would have taken place that evening so you know this required long hours long hard hours and it was hard work peter and those with him were experienced fishermen they were raised on fishing boats all their life as soon as they were weaned from their mother's breast these fishermen would have been trained for this trade by their fathers and their grandfathers. Fishing was all they knew from sunup to sundown. They are not going to just take directions from a man, especially a man who was not an experienced fisherman, to just go back out in the daylight, which was not the best time to fish, and drag their heavy nets back into the boat and go out into the deep and throw out their nets. You know, this is a command from a carpenter and the son of a carpenter. But we will see how foundational to Simon's future faithfulness and leadership as he yields to this carpenter's command. So we can see that the word of God had an impact on Simon. And the word, and it was at the word of God that Simon obeyed Jesus. It says in verse six, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So despite the apparent foolishness of casting nets after having toiled all night and catching nothing. And now such a great multitude of fish was caught to where the nets were breaking under the load. You know, the Sea of Genesaret became a sea of great harvest and those empty nets became nets of plenty and blessing. If Simon and his fellow fishermen had followed conventional wisdom instead of Jesus, they would never have experienced this miraculous catch. 
and they never would have entered into God's blessing. You know, Jesus did not tell the men to cast their nets in order just to catch a few fish or even an ordinary haul of fish. They received an over-the-top abundance of fish, so many that the nets began to tear. God is a God who delights in giving generously to his people, doesn't he? Don't we serve a generous God? When you look into the, the heavens at night, you don't see one or two stars, but you see billions of stars. When you go up to an apple tree and you pick an apple, you just you, you go up to that tree and see one or two apples? No. You see, you see hundreds of apples because God is a God of abundance. And his blessings are in abundance. If we are faithful to follow God's commands, we too will experience his blessings. So in verse seven, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. So look at how the word of God worked and transformed the lives of those fishermen who were with Simon. You see, Jesus, he chose Simon's boat, not the other boat. But because of the power of the gospel that went forth, when Simon was commanded to get back into his boat, the others followed in their boat. So actually, Jesus had entered their boat as well. And their boat became a vessel of transformation as well. You know, see, the Lord's blessings not only filled Simon's net and boat, but the blessings of the Lord poured over into abundance into the other boat. So both boats were so overflowing with a multitude of fish, they could barely handle the catch. So, well... This lesson is really not about fishing. It's really about life and ministry and following the word of God, following Jesus at his word. You know, being obedient, even when it does not seem to make sense, um, that's important. How many of you ever have been obedient to the word of God, even when it didn't make sense? You know, as you live in the flesh or the, or the natural, you know, we always seem to need to understand that that uh, the power of our own strength, of our own intellect, or our own wisdom, um, that, that is, that's all we need. Many times that's the way we think in the natural. You know, well, you know, I, have, I, I can think this thing through. I can reason this thing through. But, you know, here's the message in here that... We do need to really understand through the mind of Christ that the power of our own strength, our own intellect and wisdom, our nets will always come up empty. No matter how much you toil, your nets will always be empty. And that is what's happening to Simon and his fellow fishermen all night long. Jesus is communicating this very important truth to Simon Peter in this live demonstration. However, as we can see as we study further in the Gospels, this message or truth of Peter will not be truly understood for a long time. He needed to learn, and Peter had to learn the hard way. You know, many of us most of us, I would say all of us, have to learn lessons the hard way, don't we? You know, one time I asked the Lord why I had to learn everything the hard way, and I wanted an answer. And he answered me. He said, I'd rather you learn it the hard way and learn something than learn it the easy way and not learn anything at all. And I'll never forget that. But you know, we, we can see Peter 
and and the other disciples too they had to learn these lessons the hard way that to follow Jesus instructions and obey his word without doubting without hesitating will always result in an abundance of blessing it's always going to be the best way for us you know Peter and all the disciples they had to learn this lesson and it was not learned overnight and you know what it's not going to be learned overnight for us either so Jesus here is actually demonstrating this lesson here for not only them but for us as well later on we will actually um, he will Jesus will actually teach these words in a very clear way and we can see this in John chapter 15 in John 15 starting at verse 5 Jesus said I am the vine and you are the branches if a man remains in me and I in him he will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing so what is so amazing about this is even though Jesus taught this much later on right here he is showing Peter and his fellow fishermen this lesson in a live demonstration I don't know about you but I'm a visual person I learn lessons the best by seeing and handling rather than just reading and I think this is a really great lesson for someone that's very visual and I do like lessons that are demonstrated lessons in picture form uh, lessons that I can pick up and handle so this was a great lesson that was literally hands-on you see the fruit that we bear will be so much more significant if we are abiding in the vine abiding in Christ abiding in the vine is really the key to fruitfulness and it's amazing how Jesus used Peter's own profession to reveal to him that from now on you cannot rely on your own experience and your own understanding you know Peter knew that he had relied on that in the past and this is uh, precisely why he commanded Peter to go back out fishing after being out there all night long and catching nothing Peter needed to be shown that our natural experience cannot be relied on when it comes to following the word of the Lord when Jesus is in our boat he is saying to us I am at the helm of your life and you know when he becomes uh, when he when he takes over the helm of our life then ev everything becomes a whole different dynamic we will find that the things that we have learned in the past and all the experience that we have gathered all throughout life can actually be a determinant to following the Lord a detriment to following the Lord in the culture that we live in in the kingdom of this world as you know that uh, education experience is is a huge factor it's very important in, the, in this kingdom you know what you know what you did what you experienced what you achieved in your own intellect your own power wisdom and strength and your resume better be impressive if you want a good paying job and that's the way it is nowadays isn't it now we are capitulated into this relationship with Jesus and all of this that we had obtained in this kingdom of this world can be a detriment it can be a hindrance it can block our way you see the way things operate in the kingdom of heaven is totally opposite of how they operate in the kingdom of this world 
they're two different kingdoms. And you see, there are only two kingdoms in God's economy. You have the kingdom of this world and you have the kingdom of heaven. So, but these, the way things operate in each of these kingdoms is opposite of each other. You know, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So how did Peter respond after he saw this huge catch of fish? When Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So here we are introduced to the other fishermen who were with P, uh, uh, Simon Peter that day. It was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Peter saw in God's reality. You know, when he saw this huge catch, Peter, for the first time, saw himself the way God saw him. He saw himself in God's reality. He saw himself as a sinner who needed a savior. You know, we'll never be saved unless we see ourselves as God sees us. And he said the same thing about himself that God said, you are a sinner. And Peter said to Jesus, go away from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So let's continue with verse 10. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So Jesus reveals to him in this whole demonstration, he reveals to him his true calling, his, his spiritual calling. He's saying to uh, Simon Peter, I chose you to catch men from now on. See, that's, you know, we don't choose Jesus. Jesus chooses us. And he's saying to Simon, yes, I know you're a sinful man. You know, that's the first step to your salvation is to know you're a sinner and need a savior. And he's saying, I chose you to catch men from now on. And it says in verse 11, so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Isn't that wonderful? You know, when Jesus enters into your life, when he sits in your boat, you know, you have a decision to make. You're either going to uh, stay in the kingdom of this, uh, of, the, of this world and continue doing what you're doing, or you're gonna forsake it all and follow him and walk in the kingdom of heaven. You know, this was not the first miracle that Peter saw. If you look back at Luke 4, Jesus went to Peter's house and he healed his mother-in-law. Remember that? Jesus stood over her and rebuked a high fever that she had. And that fever left her. And immediately she rose up and served them. After that, people uh, came, uh, became um, aware of this and, and they came to Peter's house. And he's watching Jesus healing people, setting people free from bondage. So seeing this miracle of this huge catch of fish really was not the first miracle that Peter saw. But notice his reaction to this is significant. This miracle is the miracle that brings Peter to his knees. It humbled him. You know, this was not a reaction of awe when he saw this great multitude of fish. This was fear. You know, he, he was greatly afraid. And Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. What happened in this miracle that, what happened in this miracle that, that caused Peter to respond by 
by dropping to his knees in fear? Well, it was because that miracle was personal. You know, remember, Jesus stepped into his boat, which means Jesus stepped into his life. All the other miracles that he saw was done for other people. Jesus had stepped into their lives, not Peter's at that point. It, so Peter was watching all these other miracles from the outside, looking in. And so Jesus was showing Peter that he was taking the helm of his life. You are not going to be steering this ship anymore, Peter. I'm going to be in the driver's seat. So Jesus put Peter in a position where he was no longer in control of his life. And you know, this can be a very fearful thing for many people to happen in their lives. All of a sudden, oh, I'm not in control of my life anymore. You know, a lot of people choose not to be saved because they do not want to give their life over to someone else. They want to always stay in the driver's seat. They don't want Jesus taking the wheel. You know, they, they don't want Jesus taking over the helm of their boat or their life. That's a very fearful thing for people. But you know, when you give Jesus the, you know, when you allow him into your boat and you let him take over your life, Yes, Jesus, you do, the, you do the steering. You do the commanding from now on. That's the best place to be. You know, you, I would rather that Jesus do that in my life and I make it to heaven than have me make a wreck of everything in my life. In verse 11, it says, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. You know, that took a great amount of faith to do that, to leave everything that they knew to follow Jesus. Simon, Peter, James, and John, do you realize that they left their ships, their nets, and their equipment, and their family, everything behind, as well as the greatest catch that they had ever had in their lives? They left all of that behind to follow Jesus. From that moment on, their sense of identity would be changed forever. These three men entered into a relationship with Jesus, thereby becoming key figures in the community, beginning to form around Jesus. After, Jesus, after Christ's resurrection, Peter uh, we can see this later on, like in John 21, after Jesus' resurrection. Peter, as you know, denied Jesus three times during Jesus' trial. Peter went back to his boat and went back to fishing for fish. You know, not only that, but he took others with him. Peter went back into his earthly calling defeated, knowing that he had done the unthinkable, that he had denied his Lord and his Savior, and he even knew that he, is the, he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And he even swore that he didn't know him. So as we can see in John 21, Peter and others went back out fishing all night long. And guess what? When they pulled their nets up, what did they have? Nothing. Who shows up on shore that morning? But Jesus. Jesus calls out to them. Have you any fish? No. And he said, and he gave them a command. He said, throw your net starboard. Now that was something that you didn't do. Usually they dragged the nets behind the boat. 
They throw their nets and they drag those nets behind the boat, starboard, or the right side. He said, throw your nets on the right side, which means starboard, which means throw your nets in front of the boat. They did the unthinkable. They threw those nets on the right side of that boat and they caught an am abundant amount of fish again. So much so that their nets didn't even tear. There was no tearing in those nets. Another live demonstration that we need to always go forward. You see, they had to throw their nets forward, not backwards. That's a message for all of us. You know, if we mess up, you know, Peter messed up. We all mess up from time to time, don't we? We all make mistakes. We all sin. You know, when you mess things up in your life, go to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness. And when we do this, we are throwing our nets on the right side of the boat. We're going forward forward, not backwards. That's so important that even when we mess up, we come to Jesus. We need to go forward, not backwards. After that breakfast on the shore, Jesus asked Simon Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked him that. And three times Jesus told Simon Peter to feed Jesus' uh, sheep and to follow me. You know, that's so important. He had to restore. You see, Peter's calling as a servant leader needed to be restored. And it was restored that day. Aren't you glad that we serve a Savior who forgives us when we mess up and restores our calling? You know, he, he doesn't abandon us. He's given us a promise in his word. He would never leave us or forsake us. When he entered our boat, he's there to stay. He's not going to come in and out of your boat. He's there to stay. He has taken over the helm. And uh, we mess up, he's going to teach us. He's going to convict us. And he's going to teach us. And he's going to lead us into a richer life. You know, Simon Peter and James and John, as you see, they left everything in this world and follow Jesus. Jesus used the disciples' occupation as fishermen, as an analogy, uh, <clears throat> as a, an example of <clears throat> what he was calling them to do in the kingdom of heaven. That's what he was doing. He used their occupation to show him, show them their calling in the kingdom of heaven. He called them <clears throat> to be fishers of men. He's called you to do the same, to simply follow him. No matter what your secular job is, you can start your, you can state your calling as a, a, a purpose statement for your life in Christ's kingdom. So I hope and pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you this evening. <clears throat> And that uh, the Lord has laid his word down in your heart in such a powerful way. And I want to end by uh, this little prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of responding to your son's call. Help us to fulfill our calling to be fishers of men, bringing the good news to many in this lost and dying world. Please put divine appointments in our path in these troubling days to reach people who have no hope with, with a message of hope and salvation. We ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. And we certainly do live in troubling days. As you can see what's happening today, we need to pray for our nation, that there will be peace in our nation, that people will come together and uh, keeping their eyes on Jesus, not on, on things below, but on things above. Because, you know, God has a great plan for you and me. He has a great plan for the church. And we need to always keep Jesus in the helm 
of our boat at all times, even in the storms that we are in today. And as we know, Jesus and only Jesus can speak to that storm and calm it. And that's something that you and I cannot do, but it's something that Jesus can only do. We need to trust in him. So I'm going to leave you tonight. Um, have a blessed evening and may the Lord uh, bless your family and keep you all united in one mind and one accord. Amen.